Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our new series of webinars around the six themes of the CMI Women Blueprint for Balance. Uh, the CMI Network Women Network was established 50 years ago in order to promote women in management and leadership. And our Blueprint for Balance is CMI's web tool to promote diversity in the workplace and supports our objective of provide, um, producing the world's strongest pipeline of women into management and leadership. So if you'd like to suggest new resources, then please do uh, so on the Blueprint for Balance page. Uh, today, we're discussing flexible working, and my name is Matt, and I'm Strategic Partnerships and Networks Manager at CMI. I'm delighted to shortly be handing over to Emma Stewart, CEO and co-founder of TimeWise, to begin today's webinar. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can ask them using the live chat box on the right of your screen, and we shall answer as many as we can. Uh, today's session is being recorded, and it will be shared later today, along with slides for those who book to attend, and also made available in Management Direct for those of you who are already members. So welcome, Emma, and over to you to begin. Thank you, Matt. Um, delighted to be here and to be talking to you all about uh, how the world of flexible working is changing. So as Matt said, I'm Emma Stewart. I'm Chief Exec co-founder of TimeWise. For those of you who don't know, TimeWise have been around for about 15 years, and uh, we specialize in advising organizations how to improve flexible working. So um, it's been an interesting time for us. Uh, I think we've seen um, more change in some respects in the last six months than we have probably in the last 15 years. But on the other hand, um, we've seen some things in the market not change at all. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that COVID-19 has fundamentally shone a light on the need for flexible working as never before. Um, and for many firms, it's ripped up the rule book for what is and isn't possible, um, which is a very good thing. Um, but it's also fair to say that there is a big gap between remote working and all forms of flexible working. And there is a big gap between uh, taking a very rapid response to enabling people to work from home and taking a longer term, more systemic, more inclusive, inclusive and more gender balanced approach to flexible working. And as we enter this next phase um, of this very challenging time for all of us, many of the organizations that we are working with are starting to recognize that gap and they are starting to realize that they need to bridge it um, in terms of how they manage their people uh, uh, and their organizations going forward so what i really wanted to do for the next sort of 30 minutes was to talk to you a bit about what the risks are and the watch outs in this next phase as, as we explore how we can uh, enable our people uh, to work and balance work with everything else through this very, very difficult time. Also to, to just remind ourselves of where the opportunities are for fundamentally rethinking how work is done um, uh, as we come out, hopefully, of this period. And then to give you some practical suggestions about uh, what your organisations can hopefully do to try and bridge some of those gaps and to try and um, and ensure that you are taking that inclusive approach to flexibility um, with, with some pockets of, of good examples thrown in along the way. Uh, so that's the plan for today. Um, in terms of time-wise, that's us. So in terms of time-wise, sorry, I'm using your new technology here, so you have to bear with me. Um, a bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, so as I said, we've been around for about 15 years. We're a social business. I set up the organisation. Our mission is really clear and has always been that we want to enable everyone to get the flexibility they need in their careers without compromising their value in the workplace. Uh, and in order to achieve that, we do three things. The first is we undertake a lot of research and campaign work to champion the benefits of flexibility. You may have seen our Power 50 Awards highlighting at the hard end uh, people who have progressed um, into senior roles um, whilst also working part-time and we do an index every year tracking the state of the flexible vacancy market in the UK. The second thing that we do is we work with businesses um, to help them to improve their approach to flexible working and we run a range of change programs, uh, we provide training to managers and we provide broad forms of consultancy and our clients range from Google to Tesco to Lloyds Bank to NHS Trust um, and have done for many years. Firms who, who recognise the value in getting better at Flex as a way to attract, retain and maximise a very diverse and inclusive workforce. And then the third thing that we do is we run our own job site. So we provide a marketplace for people who want their next job to be a good and flexible job. And we represent about 90,000 candidates who come to us um, uh, as the place to advertise good quality, flexible roles in the market. 
So that's just a bit on us. Uh, and just a snapshot of some of the organizations that we work with, as I said, um, very broad, and many of these organizations have been on the journey of flexibility with us for a long time. So a little bit first on terminology. Um, as I said, there's a gap between remote working and flexible working. I think it's important to remind ourselves of what we mean when we talk about flexible working. And also uh, to remind ourselves that actually pre-COVID, working from home was probably one of the least um, uh, areas of take up when it comes to flexible working. So we know that uh, actually in terms of permanent remote working, uh, the proportion of people pre-COVID was around about 2%. Um, estimates that we now look at in the market suggest anything, obviously currently upwards from 50 to 70%, and we're estimating that that will, will rise, or will certainly be retained by many businesses going forward. I think what's interesting to say here, again, when we start thinking about how we can be really inclusive in our approach, is early signs and early analysis suggest that um, the take up of other forms and the availability of other forms of flexible working are shifting less. So part time is shifting less. Job show, which has always been a tiny percent, is shifting less. Um, and really, that's just a bit of a watch out, because obviously, if we are wanting to be optimistic and think about how we can evolve uh, and come out the other side with a, a better marketplace for flexibility, we do need to start thinking about other forms, not just working from home. Uh, and the reason this matters is because at TimeWise, we have been tracking uh, employee and candidate demand for many, many years. And we know that approximately nine out of 10 people in the UK either have or want some form of flexible working in their next job. And yet what we also know from our analysis of the vacancy market is when it comes to actually advertising roles at the point of hire, uh, Pre-COVID, only 15% of job vacancies across the UK referenced any form of availability of flexible working at the point of hire. So we had a, we had a market before this pandemic where uh, we had a complete mismatch between demand for flexibility and access to flexibility. Nine out of 10 of the population, effectively, when they come to move, and move is really important when we think about career progression, particularly for women, when they come to move, competing for less than 15% of vacancies where employers proactively say they're open to flexibility at the point of hire. So we uh, we have still quite a long way to go. Um, so I guess what I wanted to sort of touch on first is, is we have got a huge opportunity and we are all working incredibly hard to find different ways of working, whether you're managers, whether you're leading your organisations or whether you're working in them. Uh, and it's been really tough. Um, uh, and there are some significant pitfalls that we need to be thinking about when it comes to this next phase. And particularly when we start as organisations thinking about more blended forms of work and enabling teams to be able to come back to the office and work from home uh, and, and everything in between, um, depending on, on, on where we go. And we know that uh, things are changing on, a, on an hourly basis. Um, so, so what are some of the risks? I mean, there are a number, but I just thought I'd call out four um, uh, specifically. Um, and I guess the first is that there's a broad point around thinking about the flex haves and the haves not. Um, and we do have a risk across the labour market that we spend a lot of time talking about working from home and the binary choice of, of home or office. Um, we need to remember that for many, many people, and again, particularly women, that option isn't available to them. Um, if you're in a frontline industry, it's not feasible to be able to take a laptop and work from home. And there are some real issues that we may face more inequalities in some areas in the labour market going forward off, off the back of of this experience um, and that equalities in particular areas may be getting worse. So the first watch out um, uh, and particularly relevant for, for this conversation and for this network is in relation to women. Uh, we know that over the course of the pandemic, um, statistics showed that approximately 47% of women um, were considering dropping out of work. So balancing work and care and childcare 
is fundamentally incredibly challenging for many, many women. Um, there are some concerns that women have been disproportionately, um, particularly over lockdown, taking the bulk of domestic responsibilities and homeschooling and childcare responsibilities. Um, some research shows on average six hours more than, than, their, than their male partners. Um, and we know now that schools are back open, we've still got a big hole when it comes to childcare. So the TUC suggests that only uh, that, that around two in five women are still struggling to get the childcare they need to be able to work the hours that they need to be able to work and they're employed to. So there is a real concern here that when we think about flexible working and enabling that precarious balance between work and care um, to, and getting that right, we need to be within organisations um, ensuring that actually we encourage men to take time off, that we take uh, gender neutral approaches to how we have these kind of conversations with our teams. And obviously there are, there are wider issues that we need to be aware of when it comes to being even more flexible for female colleagues who are not necessarily going to be able to, to work at the times or the hours that they have done previously. And there's a much wider issue when it comes to government support in relation to childcare. Um, secondly, I guess there's a, there's a broader watch out just around what we would call kind of digital presenteeism, which is uh, uh, you can have that issue of, of overwork and um, the sense of, of presenteeism just as much if you're working from home as if you are in, in the office. And we all know that that often is driven by a sense of trust, managers trusting us to deliver by outputs, not necessarily by inputs, and hours worked. Um, but again, emerging research is showing that uh, issues around well-being, long hours, feeling always on, are very, very prevalent at the moment with, within many, many organisations and by many individuals. Um, again, uh, how do we address this? I'll come on to it later. Um, but there is definitely a role here for managers in, in, in understanding that we may well need to recalibrate our expectations of how much our people can deliver um, during this time and what those outputs need to look like and how we can help them to work more effectively and have those boundaries as well when they're working from home. Um, and as I said, I, I guess the other two, the watch outs, well, one certainly is around people's health and well-being more broadly. Obviously, as we look to return to work, we need to protect our vulnerable people and we need to be thinking about different types of enabling them to work uh, flexibly, whether it's start and end of the day, not just um, uh, where they work. And then finally, with our frontline teams, there is a there is a real challenge um, when it comes to uh, trying to support people in frontline roles and the, the, the need to retain some form of control and, and input into how they work is just as prevalent as it was before the pandemic. Um, and again, I will come on to some of the, the options to consider in terms of how to support frontline workers in a bit. Um, but in terms of opportunities, there are many, and we must remember those. Um, and again, we are seeing many organisations uh, that we work with and have worked with before really grappling and really innovating in terms of how they think about work. And the good news is one of the main reasons that uh, we have seen managers and organisations prohibiting people from working from home in the past is around trust. And we, as I said, have um, really had to challenge that. And for many, many firms, an issue of trust can no longer be a reason why people should be enabled to work from home. Um, a lot of the analysis shows that the majority of managers who've been interviewed in various surveys have showed that actually their people are working incredibly hard, that they've been really surprised by the level of productivity. In the main, it, most organisation surveys have shown that productivity has not dropped. It's either been sustained and in many cases it's improved. Um, and as a result of that, we know that a significant proportion of organisations are looking to retain some form of flexible working going forward off, off the back of this pandemic. Um, I think a really interesting observation from, from our perspective is the correlation which many academics for many years have always tried to make between um, proving that flexible working enhances productivity and how you make that link. Um, some of the really interesting analysis that's coming out at the moment shows that actually those organisations that are showing that their teams are more productive by working at home are doing so not because they've put lots of tech in place um, or processes in place, but actually because they have a culture that supports better work-life balance amongst their, their teams and that enables better communication and collective conversations in terms of how work is done.
So it's sometimes the things around the edges and the softer cultural and behavioural pieces that we need to remember are really, really important when it comes to enabling our, our people to do their best work. And this slide feels very outdated now, but it's just important to remind ourselves that actually there have always been uh, many reasons why uh, businesses need to embrace flexible working and why it works for businesses as, as much as it works for individuals. Um, so I guess the, the, the call out here is really to think about if you are within your firm, having those debates now about um, how you you cope with the sort of this next phase and how you enable people to start coming to the office to retain some form of flexible working. Of just a few things. Um, the floodgates have well and truly opened. Most good business leaders recognise that uh, a high proportion of people want to retain some form of flex. Um, various um, estimates suggest around 13 million people in the workforce. So being able to respond actively to that is going to be really important. Um, and make sure that in terms of thinking about how we do that as organisations, it's really important to make sure that uh, whilst we enter this tough bit, we challenge some of those assumptions, which is, OK, we need to start to go back to dot, dot, dot. Let's listen to what our teams have been telling us and let's let's capture that data to prove that actually um, uh, it will help our organisations to retain some form of flexible working and not go back to the way things were. Um, just to say, um, I'm really conscious I'm going to keep going. Um, we've had loads of questions already. Um, uh, you are going to be, um, I will be ask, answering as many as I possibly can at the end. So please keep them coming. Um, I've just been asked to remind you all. So, so flexible working works for businesses, it works for individuals, but it's, um, but it's about how you get it right. How you get it right, what we've learned at TimeWise is it's about understanding how to get that two-way flexibility, that sweet spot right between what organisations need and what individuals need. And it sounds really simple, but it's really, really complicated. It's what the Taylor Review um, referred to as two-way flexibility. And for those of you who are currently grappling with how to manage those return to workplaces um, and return to offices and how to manage teams working in different ways, this agenda has been completely amplified. Um, we know at an organisational level that if we enable our people uh, to deliver their best work, we do so in a place of trust. We do so in a way that is about managing them on their outputs and not their hours. And we do so by really understanding what are the key tasks and priorities. But we also need to recognise that individuals would have their own preferences and ways of working, um, particularly, again, amplified through this pandemic, whether it's younger people looking to come back into the office and actually just shift the start and the end time because they're isolated and their mental health is suffering, whether it's women with children or, or men with children looking to balance how they do their work and their childcare, so having flex in the middle of the day, or whether it's um, people actively wanting to try and reduce some of their working hours. Um, and we are seeing many, many firms um, who are good at this and have been good at this, grappling with the new paradigm of how to enable work by actually breaking down what are the functions and the tasks we need our teams to do and giving them permission to work that out as teams, whilst also then having those conversations as teams about how individuals need to work. Um, at the heart of all of this, we believe, is, is a culture around driving change from being reactive as organisations to flexibility to starting to be more proactive. So as a reminder, the reason we have so few jobs advertised as flex at the point of hire and have done for many years is because often m many, many firms see flexible working as something that is, is wrapped around an individual. Pre-COVID, um, if you wanted to work differently, you would, as an individual, ask. It was the employer's responsibility. Um, firms that are good at this take a much more proactive approach. They will have a clear structure and a clear way of communicating how they expect their people to work and what kind of flex is, is available to them. And they will make that work, as I said, within teams. And then it becomes a no brainer that you would articulate that when you're advertising roles at the point of hire. So COVID is, is, is making a start to make that shift, but it's cultural and it's behavioral and it will take time. And what we would actively encourage is for you to start if you are having those internal conversations to think how can we more proactively review tasks and review individuals preferences and obviously you will all be doing poll surveys and then it's about how do you respond to that 
Um, so, you know, we spent a long time excluding certain groups from the workplace, and now is the opportunity to start to think more proactively about this. And the other thing just I would say is, is very live now, we need to be thinking about um, how we do this at a trial level. It's taken many of us many, many years to get systemic, scalable, flexible working right for teams, not just for some individuals. So, you know, businesses aren't going to fix this overnight. And actually, the most thoughtful clients of ours and businesses that we work with are taking this next phase really carefully. They are trialing and they are monitoring this and they are not necessarily monitoring productivity per se, but they are testing in teams how they can enable people to work differently. And we would we would urge um, organisations that you work for to do the same. So. So when it comes to that sweet spot, obviously as managers, there is a real um, challenge, but also opportunity to manage performance differently. Um, and I just thought I'd touch on sort of some of the questions and some of the kind of issues that we're seeing coming up at the moment. Um, um, in terms of kind of thinking about, about how work gets done and how work is going to get done going forward. So in terms of the Pulse surveys, we've seen some really interesting data coming through um, for many of the firms we work with. Um, just an interesting example is uh, or the need to and the ability to work more autonomously has been a really positive thing. That, and it's been seen from by many individuals in many of the organisations we speak to as being something new. I'm trusted. I've given I'm given the freedom to work differently. But what we're starting to see are the feedback scores around that starting to slip, because what's starting to happen is that work creep and that sense of, OK, we've had the summer. And now, actually, we need to start ramping it up. So, again, just to watch out, um, you know, keep talking to people. And we need, as organisations, to make sure that we keep that pulse check, uh, making sure that, actually, we are not putting more on our teams with less. Um, and that's challenging. Um, but we have to um, recalibrate sometimes our priorities and our expectations. And business leaders have to recognise that. You know, I think we saw at the very beginning of the pandemic uh, uh, some amazing, uh, very, very quick, responsive um, firms. And a lot of the time it was just do what you can and just do what you can help people to get through. But now there's a bit of a watch out that actually as we start to get into a kind of the next quarter and six months in, um, we've got to really be thoughtful about how we manage and recalibrate those outputs. And also for managers themselves, there's been some really interesting analysis that shows that actually people that work from home in management roles often delegate less because um, you can be more insular and you are feeling the pressure to look after your teams. So therefore, the, the pressure on managers can often grow. So and just in terms of clarifying those kind of priorities, I just say, you know, we need to start asking questions differently. We need to start asking questions about why do we need to be in the office as opposed to being from home? What are the what are the reasons I have to come in? Um, and that, I think, for us is, is very much about really trying to understand, as I said, what the tasks are that you do in your job and where, when and how much um, time you need in order to be able to do them. So this is the principle that we talk about at TimeWise when it comes to flexible job design, that you know we have done a huge amount when it comes to remote and home working. But for many, many groups, particularly, again, for women, actually being able to recalibrate and have some control over when they are working and also how much they are working matters as much as everything else. And again, just some reflections of things that we're seeing and, and hearing at the moment. Um, so there's been some really interesting reflections on, on sort of if we think about obviously where we're all doing remote working now, so I won't talk to you about how to do that because you're doing it, but, but some really interesting things about when do you use Zoom and when actually do you start to kind of meet? Um, and we've had clients talk about the fact that actually, interestingly, governance meetings um, can be really efficient and effective when everybody's on Zoom because what you often have in a boardroom is you might have a few side chats and you might have some debates and you might end up kind of drifting off the agenda, but certain meetings are done really well on Zoom. But clearly, if we need to be creative and we need to um, bounce off of each other, we need to physically be with each other. The evidence is showing that actually Zoom doesn't work as effectively as that. But it's about making sure, again, when we do that, that we communicate really clearly with our teams. And we, we are spending a lot more time on our check-ins if people are working remotely. Um, and it's about finding efficient ways to do that. 
when um, clearly is about thinking about uh, all kinds of staggered hours, whether it's about traveling to work or not traveling to work, whether it's about doing the school run. But again, we would urge, um, and we do urge all firms to think about that. And then how much um, is really, really important. Part-time is one of the top ways that um, uh, women in particular um, have, have been shown in various surveys one of the top preferences when it comes to flexible working sometimes it doesn't have to be part-time and actually when you dig into analysis many people say they'd like to work part-time often because they don't have a human-sized job in the first place so the job that they are doing may be full-time but it's full-time plus so it's about again having a job where the outputs and the expectations are realistic for what you are able to do um, and we are facing a potential issue right now where we have huge opportunities to rethink part-time working um, we have part-time furlough, we have various government issues that um, we have four-day week, uh, and there are lots of complexities around that. But we also have um, a burning platform around extreme hours um, and, you know, and, and the parameters within which we need to enable people to work from home more effectively. So um, that's just a little bit on job design. Um, in terms of practicalities, so, oh, I'm going to go back again. Uh, so after this webinar, we have at TimeWise, we've produced two guides, uh, one for managers on how to manage flexibility and one for employees on how to have those conversations. We'll be sharing those with you. There's loads and loads of information in there that I'm really happy to pass on. Um, I won't go into the detail, but what I will say is, is we had pre-COVID um, a risk that we often had non-conversations in organisations about flexibility. So we had... Um, and it goes back to that latent demand and the fact that we had a lot of people who wanted to work differently, but who felt they couldn't ask because um, they might be disadvantaged. And evidence shows that particularly for part time workers, you are more impacted in terms of career progression. Um, so people don't ask. Managers, therefore, don't see people asking. Therefore, assume there isn't a demand or a need. Um, or rather, organisational leaders often don't assume that there is a demand for need. And therefore, this non-conversation happens. I think we, we need to get past the non-conversation and proactively have those conversations um, when we're managing teams, but also feel more confident as individuals that we can start to ask to work differently. And one of the things that we've been picking up is a really interesting issue around what, what some firms are calling psychological safety, which is having the comfort to know that you can, with your manager right now, talk about how you're working, the ways you're working, and not just the work that you're doing. And again, anecdotal feedback is if we can start to have those conversations in teams now, hopefully we will start to have those conversations more broadly going forward so that we feel that there is scope to be able to, to, be able to negotiate and find that sweet spot. Um, I wanted to just, I'm, I'm sort of nearly finished, but I, I also wanted to do a bit of a call out on some thoughts and some some learnings around frontline working because again one of the things at TimeWise that we are really mindful of is is the debate can often be about how do you work from home with a laptop but there are well over seven million people in the UK at the moment who work in frontline jobs um, who are on a shift or a roster um, or they're physically based somewhere where actually getting flexible working right um, means different things. For them, it often means, and it always has done, having some kind of control and input and predictability in how you work. So if you're a nurse, it's knowing that if you have your three 12-hour shifts, you know whether you're working weekends or weeks and you are able to plan your life around that. Whether it's in retail, knowing that actually you can choose when to have a weekend off so you can go to somebody's birthday party or to have a family gathering. That input and control it's really important for everybody, but it's crucially important for frontline workers. And we all have a much broader um, awareness of how frontline workers and a, and a sort of moral code, I guess, when it comes to frontline workers of how they've supported us through this crisis. Again, we at TimeWise are urging big firms who look after frontline workers to really start to think about how to, to, to enable them to have decent work and have that support and that input. Um, and at the heart of that, we've done a lot of work in this space. We run an innovation unit that, that tests new ways of working. There's lots of reports on our website you can have a look at. Um, but some of the learnings for us is this is about teams. And this is, and again, this is about all kinds of work, but it's about how you manage the interdependency 
of giving people that control and input with their team. So if it's a shift, if you um, need to change your shift, who feels that shift? But actually enabling teams to try and fix some of those solutions themselves can create fantastic results. And a lot of the work that we've done has been about equipping teams with the ability to cite their preferences and negotiate collectively together. Um, and just a, an example here, the picture here is of Tesco. Um, we did a fantastic piece of work with Tesco with a big store in the Midlands. And we did exactly that. We were able to help teams and managers give people more input into shifts. It went from two weeks to six weeks notice. And actually the work-life balance scores went from around about 40% to about 90%. So, you know, as an organization, they were within that team, giving them that predictability and hopefully keeping them and maximizing um, uh, people's performance as a result of, of just having that work-life balance. Um, so it is possible, but I think we just need to, we need to call out that there are different ways of doing this um, and we need to be aware of them. Um, the last thing I just wanted to sort of touch on is, is leadership. Um, and it's probably one of the most important, you know, we can do all of this good stuff, but fundamentally when it comes to really taking a longer term approach to flexible working, it's like anything, it needs absolute endorsement and buy-in from leaders. And we've seen some fantastic leadership over the last few months um, within uh, many of the firms that we work with. We've also seen some not so good. Um, and I guess we're, we're seeing a lot of debates at the moment in the market with uh, various people having to present to Excos um, who are wanting a new plan. So are we coming back two days a week and are we working from home three? What's it going to be? Again, I would urge um, if you're having those kind of discussions, try to trial, try to create uh, a, a wider narrative around how you want your organization to work. And there are four things that we talk about when it comes to the leadership shadow. The first is good leaders we've seen when it comes to flexible working will articulate a vision and a set of principles far broader than just a policy when it comes to flex. Um, they will lean out, they will be proactive. Um, secondly, they will, and it's an obvious one, but they will trust and they will empower their teams. So they will set parameters around um, ways of working, but then they will empower individual teams to play that out in their own way and to work that through when it comes to that piece of job design. Um, thirdly, they invest in this space. So they don't just invest in technology, but they invest in management training, particularly around job design, but also in behavioral change and in the cultural change and the internal communication that is needed to, to turn the dial. And then finally, and probably most importantly, they walk the talk. So they set the tone for their organization when it comes to how they are communicating remotely, when it comes to how um, they are trying to tackle maybe some of those kind of hierarchy of needs around people being able to choose to work flexibly because of different things. So it really, it, it goes without saying it really matters. So just to sum up, um, that's a bit of a feel for, I guess, risks, opportunities in the market. But if I was to say what are the things that we've certainly seen through this period and learned before and would it endorse going forward is if we want to shift the way we work from this short term, incredible, um, but very intense period as a result of COVID, and we are going to learn some lessons from this, then we need to be thinking of firstly as organizations, we need organizations to listen to their teams, to respond to that latent demand, to those non-conversations, to really truly understand who wants to work differently and how. Because that's the only way in this climate that organizations are going to retain really good people. Um, yes, we have huge issues when it comes to unemployment coming our way. Um, but nevertheless, we still have firms with skill shortages. And if everybody is working flexibly and the bar has raised, people who can't sustain it will, will walk. And other organizations who promote flex will attract great candidates. So we need to have those conversations. Um, secondly, we really need to be thinking about job design more broadly. It's not just about remote working, it's about other ways to enable our people to work. And then we need to be thinking really clearly about how we can articulate a vision as organizations and we can encourage our leaders to, to really lean into this. And finally, this is about taking this, this debate outside of HR into organizational change. You know, COVID has shown us that, that having a framework where we really think about how we design flexibility across an organization, um, and it's not just an HR policy, is going to be critical um, for future fit businesses. So that, that's everything from how we manage performance on outputs through to how we articulate our brand, through to how we, um, how we are really clear about how we work in teams and we, we are creative and innovative in finding solutions. 
And I'll just end. Um, this isn't new. There are lots of firms, as I'm sure you know, who've been working flexibly for a very, very long time. Um, uh, these are some of the clients that we've worked with. Um, Lloyds Bank, just to call out, have been doing some really interesting work with Agile Toolkits that talks to that piece I said earlier about looking at types of tasks and creating frameworks for how you assess where those tasks need to be done, as well as thinking about individual preferences. Um, EY have done a huge amount around well-being in the past. Managers have an objective for measuring well-being, um, and they have, at a leadership level, been walking the talk for some time. I mean, their COO um, for many years um, was, was working a four-day week. Um, there's lots of examples. Uh, we have uh, lots of examples on our power list that we produce every year. Um, I would say if you are in an organisation you think are doing great things, please enter our awards this year. Um, they're, they're live and they're on our website um, because we need more role models and we need the art of the possible through this crisis to see because there are some fantastic examples of organisations doing things differently. And I guess for me, just to end as a sort of an, a, an aspiration, if I go back to the mission of TimeWise, what, what should good look like? What do we hope will come from this? I hope that if we get some of this stuff right and it will take time and investment, then we may end up in a conversation which is much more about um, uh, why wouldn't we consider this um, as opposed to I'm not sure we'll consider this. And that's about making sure that everybody when we start to look um, to progress up in our organisations or out, and we need to work flexibly, have just as much access um, to opportunity as people who want to work in, in more of the nine to five full-time way. So I hope that's been helpful and given you some thoughts and challenge, um, and I'm really happy to answer some questions. Over to you, Matt. Thanks so much, Emma. I'm loving uh, the final line there of art of the possible. And obviously at CMI, and you and I have discussed this before, uh, you know, we very much agree that um, line managers in particular are key to making this happen and making change happen. So great, great presentation there. I think we've been looking through the the, the excellent questions that we've uh, received, and there are obviously quite a lot. Uh, and we did say we'd try and cover as many as possible. So I've tried to kind of group them together a little bit just to kind of help. So there have been a few themes that have emerged from some of the questions. So one of the first um, kind of sets of questions, I suppose, is, uh, starting off with Archana um, uh, and and then bringing in uh, questions from Steph and Carol and Michelle and again and and Chana again, and I think it's this question of uh, promotion and flexible working. So from the very first question of you know we're in the crisis, a lot of companies, a lot of organisations are just or managers are concerned with retention. You know at the moment retention of employees. So is it right to actually be talking about progression and promotion anyway at the moment? And then the, the, the following questions, looking at the correlation between flexibility and promotion, and in particular, um, the impact of that on women. So perhaps if we could kind of address that group of questions and your thoughts on um, flexible working and promotion, what needs to happen to effectively um, make sure that we have the change we're looking for. Um, I guess my, my initial thought would be, it would be a desperate shame if we've gone through this evolution in how people work and as a result, we um, still have people precluded from being able to progress into senior roles just because they work um, flexibly or they work part time. Um, so, uh, so there is a lot of evidence that actually one of the main issues and causes of the gender pay gap is a progression gap uh, and it's structural. And it's that actually uh, uh, it's not often a skills based issue, but particularly affects women. Uh, people who work part time are less, and part time in particular, are often overlooked and less likely to be able to progress into more senior roles. It's part of the reason we run our power list. Um, so the first thing I would say is, is yes, obviously businesses right now are focused on retention um, and understandable, and there are lots and lots of of things businesses are focused on right now. Um, but we can't stop the conversation about progression and good work because. We need to use this opportunity to start to, to, to leverage some of the changes we want to see in the market, particularly, as I said, for women who have currently struggled. Either they look up and they look out and they can't find good quality and flexible jobs to progress into, so they get stuck. Um, and if we can shift that after this, this crisis and have more jobs, not just the 15% that I referenced, but more jobs um, where employers proactively open that conversation 
So it's not down to the individual to ask and feel penalised or feel disadvantaged in the way. But if we can proactively do that, then I think that can only be a good thing. Yeah, and you know, picking up on that slightly, so Michelle and Anjana, you know, they they talk about visibility. Um, Michelle in particular asks, you know, whether uh, men may become more visible. And obviously, um, recently, our own chief executive uh, was interviewed by The Guardian and talked a lot about this, about white men uh, leaders in particular returning to work and the impact that might have on women and people from diverse ethnic groups. So I think, it, you know, one of the questions is around this idea of does working from home make you invisible? And if so, how do we increase visibility? Um, it can, if not managed well. Um, uh, and it has done. I, I mean, I think it, it, it's an interesting um, observation and an, an obvious one that in a way lockdown was in some ways the easy bit because um, it democratised uh, flexible working. Everybody did the same thing. Everybody worked, but if you went to the front-end industry, everybody worked from home. And some of the, the, the positive insights from that is it, is it has uh, shifted business leaders' thinking into how we can make sure that more people are visible. And there's been some really interesting analysis, sort of insights from, from particularly global firms that we've worked with, actually, who've shown that some the different teams um, who meet at a global level feel more engaged when they've previously, if they've had to, to travel and sit in a room together, haven't necessarily been been able to be so. So there is some real there is some real positives in terms of visibility, um, but I think um, I think we have to be very careful right now, particularly when it comes to business leaders coming back into the office. Um, we've been hearing again anecdotal sort of feedback that. Um, uh, it's a sort of personal bias issue, which is if you are a white male and you uh, are of a certain age and you are able to work from home very comfortably um, uh, and you are able to work in an office very comfortably because maybe you have your own office and you have your door, etc., that 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 affiliate uh, sort of association bias piece will play out and you won't necessarily assume that everybody else has those opportunities. So, um, so you know, we've got we've got lots of things going on right now. What we need to do is we need to encourage business leaders to really listen and respond to the feedback that we're getting from teams. Um, and that's the role of managers and HR to make sure that that information comes up. And we also need to make sure that wherever, at whatever level we have conversations, we are able to include people who, um, who may otherwise have felt not included, whether they are, you know, Part time, it's about how do you schedule certain times of the day and the week to have meetings with people who may not always be here. If it's remote, it's about making sure that um, you may all be on Zoom because if some of you are sitting in an office and some of you are on Zoom, they are the chances are they are more likely to be excluded from that conversation. So we're going to have to adapt processes and structure as much as behaviours. Picking up on that as well, then. So I mean, influencing leaders. We had a question from Kirsten. <clears throat> asking about kind of, I, I guess, kind of breaking this culture of distrust. How leaders can really build a culture where other employees, other workers, you know, uh, distrust flexible workers, or I think the quote was skiving um, from Kirsten, and uh, it links into a, a, a question that we've had from Dionotra. Uh, you know, resistance by leaders to formalise um, flexible working by contract, and you know, I will say that we 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 do have an international audience today. We seem to have. Uh, people watching in from uh, Nepal and India and elsewhere. So um, I appreciate that we've been talking about the UK context in particular, uh, mostly, but your, your comments earlier on the international organisations that you work with are very helpful. So I suppose, you know, what, what, what would be your kind of key practical tips for a manager who you know wants to advocate flexible working, but perhaps there's resistance at the top by the leaders? How do you how do you really affect leaders? Influence? I mean, it's been it's been it's the classic issue and it has been for a very long time um uh so there are a number of things that managers can do i think uh the first is we would always advocate some form of informal flexibility as a trial um there's often a resistance and an assumption when we talk about flexible working that this means policy change um it doesn't have to and actually um the best way to to try and prove that you can trust people who work from home and that performance will be just as good, if not better, is just to trial it and then to, to, to show that. Um, uh, there are various schools of thought, which is to push harder at managers, but I think what we've seen certainly, again, and it comes back to kind of behavioural change around this, is that 
the organizations who have done this well have have trialed, have tested, and have used that evidence and the data to reflect back to their business leaders that um, that there isn't going to be any impact on trust and performance. Um, but there's a much broader point to make here, which is which is if you don't trust people, they shouldn't be working for you. <laughs> you know, there's a really there's a really fundamental basic point here, which is that um, we conflate trust with the permission to work flexibly. And, you know, you can be working down the corridor from, from your leader and not see them for three weeks, but in the office, and they sort of feel it's okay. So we just have to call out and challenge some of these assumptions around trust. Um, as I said, we can test and trial and prove and show the data, um, uh, but we also just have to challenge this. And there's a lot of data out there to, to support the evidence, and it's coming through thick and fast now. Um, Government Equalities Office just in the UK have an observatory, and they publish information, and I know CMI does just to show um because the other thing that business leaders do is they listen to other business leaders and if you can show them other organizations in their space that are trusting their teams then that will have an impact as well great and talking of coming through thick and fast please do continue to submit any comments or questions uh we will keep looking at them if there are further questions that the audience have um I think I'd, I'd like to kind of address a uh, pre-submitted question we got and perhaps link it together with a question that we had uh, from Harriet as well. So the pre-submitted question was, what can be done to persuade men that work-life balance should be as big an issue for them as it is for women? Um, and Harriet's uh, question similarly um, asks about this idea of how do we change the narrative that women are struggling to find childcare so they can work, to families needing childcare. Um, so I wonder if you could pick up on this point um, around, uh, you know, influencing men in particular, and also this idea of it, it being an issue for both men and women. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a huge issue. And I think there are only, there are certain things that employers can do, and then there are certain things that we need to do at a far more societal level at home to have these kind of conversations. Um, and also the perception that we have and the narrative we have within everything that sits around us within the media, I mean, it, it, it's a broad issue. Um, I mean, what, from our perspective at, at TimeWise and from the research that we've done, um, the number of men that want to work flexibly is not that far behind the number of women who want to work flexibly. So the first thing to say is men do want to work flexibly. Um, what we have been seeing increasingly um, over the last few years is those men who are starting to ask are starting to experience some of the same challenge and stigma and bias when they ask to work less or they ask to work differently as women do and you know if anything that's going to create a bit more of a level playing field in terms of of, of, of kind of the journey that, that men and women are going on um, at an organizational level what's really really important is um, uh, and we talk about it a lot with our clients and they did is, is to think about how you communicate this um, in a reason neutral way so we talk about gender neutral workplaces and we talk about gender bias um, but if we're talking about flexible working we need to kind of go a, a little bit of a step further and actually talk about how you can make it work as an organization and not why you need to make it work because um, there is still deep set bias and there are still what we would call hierarchy of needs within certain firms where they will consider flex if it's because of childcare or if it's because of something very specific and they won't necessarily consider flex because somebody just needs to balance their life and their work a little bit more or they just need some time out to be more creative. If we can start to shift the culture and the conversation to being reason neutral, not just gender neutral, then we start to create more opportunities and cultures where people can just ask and talk about how they need to do it, not why they need to do it. Um, and that, in some respects, I think will start to challenge the assumption. Um, in terms of, we also need more men at senior levels doing this. Uh, and we, again, we have some on our power list um, uh, and we need to call out those examples and we need to find them in our organizations and we need to promote them as actively as we possibly can. In terms of the narrative on childcare, 100% agree. Um, I, I know, I mean, the, the evidence that I cited earlier from the TUC you know, talked about the impact on women um, uh, specifically. Um, 
And that's because at the moment, uh, for whatever reason, I think, you know, women are the ones that are taking the, the choices or having to make those decisions or choosing to make those decisions to drop out of work. And it definitely shouldn't be the case. It should be shared. Um, but I think, you know, the more, again, we can do in terms of internal comms and storytelling within our organisations. And, and we're starting to see, you know, we have, we've all been on Zoom with our kids rushing in and our pets and God knows what else. I think we just need to hold on to some of that human side um, and see people in the round. Uh, but this is this is going to take a long time. We're not going to tackle gender inequality just because of a pandemic. It's you know it's going to require much more stru structural change. And there is a role for legislation within that as well, which is probably a conversation for a whole other time. And absolutely, and if people are interested in that conversation, we did start that conversation on a recent podcast actually, so they can tune into our Management Transform podcast, which talks a little bit more about the policy landscape for flexible working. Um, picking up, Emma, on, on well, staying with men for the time being, if that's okay, uh, we have a question from Neil, um, which I think kind of asks about the size of the pie. And this kind of relates to some of the comments you made earlier about the number of uh, good flexible working opportunities there are, and perhaps the number of good part-time working opportunities there are as part of flexible working. So Neil asks, would you expect more take up of part-time work by men in this situation and that leading to more flexible working? or a reduction in available positions for women. So I suppose it's a question around kind of, is the, is the pie too small for perhaps the in, number of people that might want part-time work going forward due to, due to the crisis? Uh, the pie is definitely too small right now. Yep. Um, I think, and I think we just need to be careful about um, thinking about the availability and what is offered by businesses and um, what is taken up. Because, uh, you know, again, based on what I was saying earlier, what we need to shift is the assumption that it's about individuals asking and it should be more about organisations offering and doing that proactive thinking about how can this job be done and what am I open to when it comes to people either progressing internally in an organisation or, or coming into to, to my business from the outside. Um, so there are none, there, obviously there are steps to this. There are conversations that happen where people want to um, reassess their hours or their ways of working between individuals and managers and we know from the research we've done with the CMI actually that just at the moment um, very few managers will proactively ask is the way you're working suiting your work-life balance and, and how you need to perform in your job. Um, uh, the research we did with yourselves last year I think showed that only one in five managers ever actually asked that at a performance or an appraisal meeting. So so we need to start asking those kind of questions um, in order to shift that dial from I have to ask to um, I'm being asked. And I think if we start to do that, we will start to open up the pie a bit more because it will force organisations and, and teams to think about how we can recut work differently. When it comes to part time, um, part time is it's, it's one of the hardest bits because you are fundamentally redesigning a job. So what we've seen in the market historically is people often ask when they come back from mat leave or paternity leave or you know some life change happens and a manager will often say yes because they want to retain them but they won't redesign the job. So you know if you want to go from five days to three where do the other two days go? Who does that work? Does that work get done by your team? Does that work get done by a job share partner? Does that does that work not get done because you don't need to, because you'd be more efficient? Those are the things we need to start to think about um, when it comes to thinking specifically about part-time opportunities. Um, but, you know, there's huge opportunity. I mean, a third, I think a, a, about a third of, a quarter, sorry, of, of um, people in the UK do work part-time. So part-time is huge already, but the challenge is it's, it's at the bottom of the labour market and it's about how we, we you know, and it's in frontline roles and those kind of industries where it always has been about how we unlock potential for part-time and senior roles as well. Great. I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm very sorry, but we are going to have to start wrapping up actually. And I know there's a couple of questions. Uh, so Mandy and Jem both asked about managing remote workers. I think um, at CMI, if you're members, we've got um, other resources available. We've had webinars on managing remote workers and there's lots of information on management direct. So please do take a look at that. Uh, we had a great question from Catherine as well asking about what we can learn from other countries. So I think talking about Scandinavian countries in particular. Uh, and I think that's one where perhaps again, you know, looking forward, we might be able to have a conversation about international uh, comparisons. But I wonder if you have, you know, just a very couple of quick thoughts on international comparisons. Who are leading the way in this space, Emma? 
Well, I mean, it's fair to say the Scandinavian countries are good at this, um, but they've spent 30 years um, uh, trying to be good at this, and they've put legislation in place to enable that. They have um, uh, fantastic childcare. Their government has invested in this. Um, uh, they still have challenges. They still have some challenges when it comes to uh, issues around bias, when it comes to part-time and progressing. Um, but their work-life balance is, is much, much better as a society. So, I, you know, yes, absolutely point to Scandinavian countries. Um, but what we need to learn about is is what are the structural things that they have invested in and, and how have they learned over time culturally to do this? Um, that's the kind of, that's the art of the possible. Uh, but there's a lot more that we, we can do to achieve that. Um, uh, yeah, and we can learn from, from elsewhere as well. Absolutely. And on that note, I, I, I will bring this uh, webinar to a close. It's been uh, really interactive. It's thank you ever so much for everyone submitting their questions. I you know, apologise that we've not been able to get through quite all of them, but you can see that we did receive uh, a huge amount. So hopefully we've been able to cover off at least the big themes of the questions. Um, it leaves me really to thank uh, Emma for your insights and expertise. And we do have um, more webinars coming up, like I say, on the different themes of uh, blueprint for balance so the next one will be on 8th of october and it's looking at an ambitious new approach to inclusion uh, with the authors of a new book called indivisible and following that we'll have on the 19th of october a webinar on pay and rewards uh, with andrew baisley from the Fawcett society um, and you as mentioned you can uh, find and share useful gender balance resources with our blueprint for balance portal and you can click the link below in the comments uh, to find out more about that and if you're not yet a CMI subscriber, please do click the link that we've put in the uh, comments to get access to thousands of practical development resources, some of which have been mentioned by um, Emma today as well, in terms of uh, the resources that are available to our members. And if you are new to CMI, uh, do join uh, using the link shared in the live chat again, or you can sign up to our free CMI newsletter. So it leaves me to thank Emma once again. Thank you ever so much on behalf of CMI and CMI Women. And thank you all for participating and your very kind comments coming through, um, thanking Emma for such a great session. So enjoy the rest of your day and uh, have a great afternoon all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.